You got zero at the table, man. All kinds of shit break through. Pick me, pick me. Zero's at the table, you gotta be careful. All kinds of shit break through, baby. Greetings, humans, and welcome back. I'm Joey Pigtails, and this is episode number 17 of my poker vlog called Hijinks in Hollywood, Part 1. This is the first time I had the opportunity to record at the Seminole Hard Rock Hollywood, and I want to give a quick shout out to Jason and Jordan, the tournament directors who made this process easy and who ran an amazing series. The staff and operation here is absolutely top notch, and I enjoyed having the chance to exist in the environment they created for us there. In this episode, I'm going to be going over the more interesting hands that I played during the first 10-ish hours of cash gameplay, including some massive pre-flop action, huge all-ins, and some questionable decisions. But first, I'm going to recap my tournament results and my thoughts on the trip. If you want to skip ahead of the hands, you'll find them here. I'm also going to be starting a discussion about calling the clock and referencing a recent incident at Orange City, so you'll find that discussion here after the hands. And one more thing, I'm going to be doing a giveaway to help grow the channel, uh, with the details being here. So my trip down to Hollywood was just the sort of thing I needed. I was sort of stuck in a rut mentally, as I'm in the midst of a downswing, and I looked at this trip to Hollywood as a chance to break up my routine, shift my consciousness into a spontaneous mindset where anything and anything was possible, and jump into an environment where I can talk poker with people who are as knowledgeable, if not more knowledgeable than I am, at these games. Thursday evening, I rolled into Hollywood and jumped right into the $400 PLO event. I ended up firing two bullets in this event, having run into a monster early, but worked my second bullet all the way up to busting on the bubble with double-suited aces. It's not the way I wanted to go out, but it feels good to put up good, a, a, a good performance and gain more experience in these events. I intended to fire the $600, $2 million guarantee event Friday morning, but the six of us at the Madhouse Poker House ended up hanging out until around 3 a.m., so getting up early was out of the question. I fired two bullets on Friday evening, but couldn't find a bag. I fired another two bullets Saturday morning, still not finding a bag. There was still one more flight left Saturday evening, so I fired another shell. After registration ended, I found myself sitting with less than two big blinds after suffering a cooler, and somehow ran that stack back up to 40 big blinds by the end of the 2.5k level. I wish this story had a fairy tale ending, but sadly, I bubbled this event too, set over set in the last hand. The next day is where the vlog picks up the story, when I finally sit down for some PLO cash games. Quick notes before we get started. This is a 2-2 PLO game that plays with a $5 winner's rock. So if you win a hand, you are forced to straddle $5 the next hand. It's a $200 to 1K buy-in game, and I bought in for $500. Also, it's a time break game of $7 a half hour. The first hand was on the dealer chains where they charge us time, and the table agreed to a $25 blind raised pot to cover the rake and have some money to play for, as it's normally a $10 bomb pot minus the rake. I look down at Queen Queen 5 Deuce, which are pretty ugly queens, but we play what we get. With a flop of Jack 5 Queen Rainbow, I've blinked a set, so let's get paid here. I fire 100 bucks uh, when checked to, and it's folded around to the player on my right who makes the call. The turn is a 3, and when checked to, I go ahead and stick my 290 into the middle, looking for to uh, charge the draws, and uh, our opponent ends up folding, and he said that he actually had a, uh, a wrap there, uh, and made a disciplined fold, so glad he folded it in, didn't get there, so cool. I missed a little preflop action here, but I 3-bet this to $55 preflop with some pretty good looking aces and get two calls. With a flop of ace-jack-6 rainbow, I flop top set again. I should have bet less here, but I went ahead and fired 150. Looking back, there isn't much that is going to call a bet here other than lower sets or Broadway wraps, and my aces are pretty much face up, so we can look to bet really small here and either try to keep it multi-way or potentially get someone to spaz out. There's a limp. I limp ace 10 five, five, three spades. Uh, there's another limp, and we see a raise to 35. As usual, we go heads up. I mean, we go five ways to a flop of 10-10-4 rainbow. I flop top trips here, but in this situation, it's typically better to not have a pair in your hand to increase your odds of boating up in case that's needed. But this is still pretty strong. 
The original aggressor leads this for 100, and I go ahead and repot it. My villain calls off, and he also ends up having ace 10. We run two boards with the top running clean uh, and us chopping that board, and the bottom board actually runs out 4-4, four, four, and I end up taking three quarters of this pot with a boat on the bottom with my pair of fives. So I got pretty lucky here boating up. Um, as I said earlier, it's bad, typically, to have a pair in your hand in this situation, but in this case, it did actually work out pretty well. With an early open to 15 and one call, I go ahead and call with 5-5-8-9-3 five, five, hearts, and we go three ways to a flop. With 50 in, we see five, six, seven, two diamonds, and I flop the nut straight and bottom set with a backdoor hard draw. One check two, I go ahead and pot it to 50, and both players call. The turn is clean with the king of clubs, so one check two, I go ahead and bet 175 of my $400 stack. Surprisingly, both players call. The river is one of those cards we didn't want to see in the Jack of Diamonds, bringing in the front door and most obvious draw. I'm not putting more money in this bot now, so the river actually gets checked around, and the first position player wins with a six high flush. All right. By the way, I noticed the camera's kind of shaking here. My GoPro is acting up a little bit. Uh, that effect is actually kind of cool, uh, but I'm going to try to keep that edited out for the most part. There's one limp, and I pot it to 25 with some okay aces. This sees two calls before seed number two announces $50 blind. The player on my right calls, and I go ahead and repot it to 250. We see an all in for less. Uh, seat two calls, and seed four calls for less. We end up getting it all in on the flop of Jack 10 2 uh, Rainbow and chop the side pot, but seat 2 and 3 end up chopping the main as seat 3 hit a boat with Jack 6 on the bottom. Doing some reflecting on this hand, these aren't the best aces we can see, and taking the aggressive line I took pre flop made getting it all in on the flop sort of mandatory. We could consider just calling preflop with a specific combo of aces and then only lose $50 on the board when we miss instead of losing $250 plus. Uh, the dynamics of always going multi-way in 3-bet pots post slot means we need to adjust our ranges to minimize risk and maximize returns. So, you know, okay aces, maybe not 3-bet, maybe just go ahead and call. In the next hand, I look down at some okay jacks. This is essentially a three card hand as that two is really ugly, but I'm stuck and tilted at the moment, so I go ahead and play them. We see a limp, an open at 20, a call, and I go ahead and complete on the button. The limper then pots it to 105, the original razor calls, the rock calls, and I guess I can't fold here either, so I go ahead and make that call too, getting like 700 to one. With 420 in, we see a flop of queen, seven, four, two clubs. I flopped a number two flush draw, and maybe a set draw, backdoor straight draw, all of it, right? There's one check from our preflop check raiser, a jam for 235, and a call. <sighs> all right, I've got $290 behind, so sure, whatever, let's go. We run two boards where I hit a set of jacks on top, which ends up being no good as the player in seat four hit a straight, uh, but I do end up hitting a flush on the bottom, even though the board paired, uh, but it's good enough to go ahead and take half the pot. Cool beans. Exactly one orbit later, I wake up with king, queen, jack, jack, double suited on the button. There's a limp, an open to 15, one call, and I go ahead and call, although this should be a three-bet preflop in hindsight, and a raise on my left. This guy in C2, who looks and sounds just like Jamie Gold says, I call whatever it is. And then the player on my right now goes into the tank and finally jams for his $510. This is a premium hand, so I'm tilted and not going to fold here, so I go ahead and jam my $660 in, and we end up going four ways to two boards. I ultimately scoop the side pot and get about $300 back, and my king holds up on the bottom to get half of the main pot with two pair. The next hand is a $10 single board bomb pot where $49 comes out for rake, leaving $31 to fight for. 
We can still bet up an $80 on the flop, though. I'm dealt ace king 10 7 double suited, and we're off to a flop of king 10 2 1 club. Perfect top two pair. We see a bet of 50. I call, and two others call as well. I can argue for a raise here, but let's see what develops on the turn. Which is the three of clubs. It's checked to a middle position player who jams for about 150, and I go ahead and pot it, putting everybody all in. The other players fold, and we run the boards out. The other player had a three card wrap with Queen Jack 9 and bricked out, so I scoop this one up. In the grand scheme of things, this isn't the best of the double suited ace hands we can see, but the game is loose, so let's play it. There's a raise to 25 from seat 2, and four of us come along to see a flop of ace 3 4 2 spades. I flopped a gut shot, 6 high straight draw, queen high spade draw, and top pair. King high flush draws are usually betting this flop, so when it's checked around to the 8 of spades uh, on the turn, I'm fairly certain I'm ahead. I fire 75 when checked to, which sees one call from an early position player. The river is the two of clubs, and I fire $200 after the opponent checks. This was clearly too much as they quickly folded. What would a better sizing have been? Let me know what you think. This was the last hand of the short session as I was grabbing a meal with the Madhouse Poker guys. We see an open at 25, a call, and then the player on my right pots it to 110. I'm never folding with this hand here, so I make the call to evaluate. The player on my left calls, as does seat 2 and seat 3. With 550 in, we see a flop of Jack 8 2 2 diamonds. The player in seat 4 now jams when checked to, and the rest of, uh, of the stacks are pretty small, and everyone looks a little froggy, so I go ahead and get it in, and we are four ways all in on this flop. Now of note here, the player in seat 4 says one time, so the main pot is only once. The side pots, however, are going multiple times, so you're going to see uh, two turns and two rivers. With these runouts, you'll notice I bink top set on the top board, which is the nuts, and I end up chopping the side pots. So I end up scooping a pretty massive pot here with that main pot being pretty big. In the next hand, we see 9775 tri suit and limp in. There are a bunch of limps before the player with the rock makes it 15. As usual, no one folds, and we're six ways to a flop, which comes 744. I flop top boat, which is a dream scenario. It's checked to me, and I bet $50, hoping for some action. An action we get. It's folded to the late position player who jams for about 200, and the player on my right then immediately jams for about 300. I snap call, of course. In this specific situation, seeing two other people push the action usually means they both have a four, so we usually have both players drawing virtually dead unless they have an overpair. The dealer gets the pots right, and we run the board out one time to the expected result of a scoop. In this hand, we see an open at $20 on my right, and I go ahead and 3-bet with double-suited, double-paired kings to $75. I see three calls before the player on my right now jams all in for $170. This reopens the action, so I go ahead and pot it to $810, expecting the other players to fold here. However, that doesn't happen, and we end up going four ways all in to one board that comes out three spades, along with the board pairing on the end, and I whiff this and end up having to rebuy. Was this a punt? These PLO games are always so finicky. Sometimes they are super loose and passive preflop and extremely tight postflop, and other times it's like this, where we get it all in multi-way preflop constantly. You have to be ready for this insanity. There's a limp and an open to $15, and I go ahead and call with king, queen, 10, 8, 3 spades. The player on my left now 3 bets to 70, two other players make the call, and I go ahead and complete to see a flop of ace, 10, 8 with the ace of spades, but it's rainbow board. I flop bottom two pair, a gut shot, and a backdoor spade draw. An early position player now jams for 180, and perhaps a tilt call is in order? That gut shot could be good, right? Nah, let's try and practice some of that discipline that helped me get here. Did someone say something about discipline? I'm on the button with 8764 Badoogie. We see a bunch of limps, and I limp as well. The player on my left now pots it to 
and the player on his left goes ahead and makes it 100. And then we have a short stack that now calls 100. What is going on here? The player on my right now calls, and sure, why not? The original Razor now repots it, basically turning his hand face up as aces, and none of us are folding, so let's get these pots right and run it. With a board of Queen 3, 7, 9, 10, I end up with a number 3 straight. Small blind announces Kings, and he gets a little side pot. The guy on my right has a set of 9s, and he gets a big side pot. And I've got number 3, and I get a side pot. And the guy in seed one has a king high straight, so he gets pot two. It's like Christmas here in Hollywood. The next hand is a bit embarrassing, to be honest. My camera was acting up, and I just changed the battery out, so I missed the last hand where I got stacked. I've just rebought for the second time this session, and we pick up the action with $160 in the middle, going four ways to a flop of king of diamonds, jack of clubs, seven of spades. I flop a double gutter straight draw. The early position player leads for pot, and I decide to make a call here, as does another player. The turn is the five of hearts, which is a brick, but at least it doesn't bring in a flush draw. It's checked to the player on my left who jams, and I end up making a call, getting about four to one of my money, and I end up bricking out and getting stacked for the third time today. Okay, well... Sometimes we crush it, and sometimes sessions don't go our way and questionable decisions get us in trouble. It reminds me of this episode, where preflop mistakes compound into worse post-flop results. Will I pull it together on this trip? Part 2 is going to be coming soon. Before you go, I want to talk about calling the clock for a few minutes. Now, some of you have probably never called the clock on anyone ever before. I'd even guess that some of the more recreational players haven't even seen someone call the clock on someone else, and might even view calling the clock as faux pas or even disrespectful. I know I can relate to these views in some ways myself. The rule for calling the clock is generally vague, usually utilizing verbiage along the lines of, if a player has gone beyond a reasonable amount of time, another player can call the clock. Reasonable amount of time being a sticking point here. I think we can all safely say that calling a clock after about 20 seconds in any post-flop spot is pretty egregious. While getting long, 20 seconds doesn't fit my idea of going beyond a reasonable amount of time. Shoot, 30 seconds doesn't get me thinking about calling a clock. I'd get concerned around a minute and might say something like, it's getting long if it goes beyond that. I'm usually more lenient for big all-in spots. I'd like to think that mindset is pretty standard. Let me know if your concept of this is different. So in this incident at Orange City, we have a player at the table who's been pushing action and spraying some chips around. He's checked the flop in a four-way pot and has now called the clock on the next player to act after not quite 20 seconds. The player to act has traditionally taken longer than other players to act in spots, but nothing egregious so far. Immediately after he calls the clock, Everyone at the table, including the dealer and that player, speaks up and scolds this guy. And rightfully so. This was egregious. Now, poker is a game of mental warfare, and sometimes people throw etiquette out the window to tilt people. And sometimes people take a disliking to other people for whatever reasons they can find and choose to push those lines. I can't speak to anyone's motives but my own, but I will speak up if I think someone is wrong, like in this case. Don't be this guy calling the clock prematurely. Just don't do it. Now, two wrongs don't make a right. I've had the clock called prematurely on me before, and I know what it's like to be in the middle of thinking about a decision and having someone pull you out of that by essentially accusing you of taking too long, which flips your mind into a fight-or-flight mindset, wondering why we're being attacked in this manner. I get it. In this specific instance, the player was also rightfully angry. They scolded the other player in tune with the rest of us, and then went silent. The dealer waited a few seconds, and then let him know he can take his time, and no clock is being called. He then looks at the dealer and says, No, get the floor. He called the clock, and we're going to wait until it counts down. And the floor came, and he listened to the issue, which took another minute. The floor then gave the guy another minute before starting his one-minute count cool, uh, countdown, and the player literally waited for the countdown to end before giving the dealer his cards, all the while staring at the player who called the clock. Again, two wrongs don't make a right. Both of these players made mistakes, and the reason why I'm sharing this specific incident is this. 
we all ultimately have a limited amount of time left here. Literally every second that goes by is a second we cannot get back. We cannot control the actions of others, and sometimes people do some really dumb or hateful or, or even egregious things, whether to us or to others around us. We cannot, or we can, however, control how we respond to these trials and tribulations, at least for the most part. I'm not saying we should be subservient or courteous towards someone who's being disrespectful to us, but we can take a measured response to these people and ensure that they understand that their behavior is not okay. That even at the poker table, with all the gamble gamble going on, we can still be relatively civil to each other and have a good time. One more thing about calling the clock. I understand that a lot of people view calling the clock as disrespectful, even if the person is taking three or more minutes on a decision. I want to encourage you all to rethink this view. Even the most complicated of decisions shouldn't take three minutes on any street. Some argue that if the pot is huge, they can have all the time that they want. No. I disagree with that too. We all have time to think about the hand while it's going on, while the action is on others, and we are actively observing them, and then we get more time when the action comes to us. Let's not get carried away with tanking forever, even if others will tell us it's okay. Something to consider, which you may find controversial. One of my pet peeves is when someone is tanking, they stop their thought process to apologize. It's a waste of time, and if the person is more concerned with annoying the rest of us by taking so long instead of coming to a decision, then perhaps we need to call the clock at that moment and help them end it. Now, almost every single time I've wanted to do this but didn't, the person who tanked too long and apologized for it ended up calling, whether right or wrong. So maybe I need to reconsider my view and apply all of that patience and understanding I keep preaching about. Food for thought. Now, for those of you that have stuck around with me so far, I want to show my appreciation. One lucky person is going to get a free shirt from my Teespring store. If you haven't checked it out, I hope you do, as I have some pretty cool designs up there with more coming soon. How can you be this lucky person? I need some help growing my channel. This is only going to be open to people in the continental U.S. and Canada, because I'm not rich yet and can't afford a million dollars for shipping, so as long as you want it sent somewhere over here, you're in. Here's the deal. In this video, I repeatedly used a word that most of you, if you share my weird sense of humor, will recognize from one of my favorite movies, Talladega Nights, The Ballad of Ricky Bobby. You have until the end of the day Monday, June 10th, to do the following. Jump onto Twitter, follow me there, at Joey Pigtails, then share this video, hashtag the keyword I'm looking for, which I've repeated many, many times here, and while you're at it, go ahead and tag Will Ferrell and John C. Riley for the hell of it. After the time period ends, I use a random number generator to determine a winner from the entries and reach out via DM on Twitter for your contact info to send that shirt out. Thank you all for stopping by and sharing some time with me. It means a lot to hear all the positive vibes and constructive feedback from you all in the comments and on social media. And I look forward to continuing to grow and evolve with you on this journey. Part 2 will be coming very soon. Until then, I'm Joey Pigtails, and I am Transparent, reminding you to be a good human. Bye.